thank you very much for joining us today for this event organized by the MORE Consortium. MORE stands for Multimodal Optimization of Road Space in Europe. I'm very pleased to welcome you all on behalf of the consortium. My name is Peter Jones, I'm the scientific coordinator and I'm based at University College London. So today we're going to have a two-part event um, around the whole issue of road space reallocation, governance challenges, practical issues and visions for future streets. So this morning, um, uh, well, so the day's in two parts. So uh, this morning, um, you'll see we're going to focus on governance challenges and practical issues over a two hour session. And then this afternoon, uh, we're going to focus on visions of future streets with various insights. Um, the presentations and recordings have been available online subsequently. And just a bit of housekeeping. Um, we'll make sure that everybody who's registered receives the presentation our email uh, after the event today. The session will be recorded and, and that will also be available. Um, we invite you to ask questions. If you do that in the Q&A box, then at various points during the morning, we'll have uh, short sessions for uh, the speakers to answer questions that you've raised. Uh, and also please feel free to use the, uh, the chat uh, function as well to, to make comments and suggestions. But what we'd like to do uh, at the start of the thing uh, is really to find out who our audience is. So um, we'd like to know what kind of organisation that you work for or represent. So uh, you'll see now on the screen, um, the question has come up with a, a set of different boxes. Um, you can now uh, move your mouse and you can click on uh, one of those. So if you would do that, then uh, in a few minutes, uh, we'll have a look and just get a sense of what people said. So please, uh, just on your screen, just click one of those boxes or other. Um, and then in a minute or so, we'll, we'll see uh, what answers we've got. Okay, thank you. So we've got a good spread here. We've got uh, about a fifth of people from local or regional authorities, a quarter from universities or research institutes, 20% from consulting firms, another 25% uh, from NGOs or other organisations and amongst other people. So um, thank you very much. Um, I think people are still coming in, but just wanted to get an initial sense of, of where we are there. So what I'm going to do, first of all, is give a brief introduction and explain a little bit about more to everybody as a context for what's going to be happening this morning. So the challenge that we tackled in, in putting together this consortium, doing this project, is recognising that in our urban areas on our busier streets, demands and pressures are increasing due to a variety of factors. The emergence of new modal options, such as e-scooters coming on the streets, uh, growing mobility related sectors, and we've all seen during COVID the rise in home deliveries of all sorts of things, including uh, cooked foods, a greater interest in uh, sorry, place-related activities, the fact that people think of cities as important places for congregation and we want high quality environments and also densification in many cases of our population and employment, all putting extra pressures on streets. But our curb and carriageway space is largely fixed, so the pressures and conflicts tend to intensify. So the question that Moore addresses is how do we address this conundrum? And we say we do that by using street space more flexibly and more dynamically. And so the project's been tackling this uh, issue. As I said, more stands for multimodal optimization for road space in Europe. And the context of the, pro uh, the project is looking at the, the urban nodes on the trans-European networks the, and how the traffic comes off the uh, trans-European network and goes into the center of cities, to the city center, ports, and so on. And how we actually tackle that uh, those pressures from the international network into the heart of cities. And what we're doing or what we've done in more is to develop a series of tools and processes that will enable these key routes into the cities to be better planned, designed, managed and operated in a way that make them responsive to future pressures and in a flexible way. And to do that, we've developed a set of tools around how to develop uh, and generate innovative design options to how better to engage with stakeholders in the process of street redesign in order to um, look at the impacts of different designs on the streets to do some big detailed micro simulation of traffic and pedestrian behavior, and also then to do a comprehensive evaluation of different design options. 
We have a, a large consortium consisting of um, a number of universities, and you'll, you'll hear from those in the course of the morning, um, a number of consultancies, um, a number of NGOs, uh, and also five cities. And these five cities, the colours there show the different trans-European corridors. So our five cities, London, Malmö, Lisbon, Budapest, and Constanza, um, actually covered six of those different uh, European, trans-European network corridors. And you'll, you'll hear from some of the cities uh, again in a few minutes. I just want to introduce uh, a couple of the sort of concepts and, and ideas that we've been working on in more. The first of all is, as you come in from the trans-European network into the centre of cities, then the nature of those routes changes. And we make a distinction between what we call roads and streets. So roads very much in the outer areas, we're talking about motorways, expressways, that sort of thing, where the, the roads are just for motorised, moving motorised traffic and nothing else. And then as you come into the older parts of the cities and the denser part of the cities, they sort of morph into what we call streets, where you've got uh, not just motorised traffic, but you've got moving pedestrians and cyclists, You've also got buildings on either side that actually attract people to come to those streets. You've got people meeting and so on on the street. You've got people crossing the road and you've got pressures for loading, parking, drop off and pick up. So the, the pressures on those parts of the network are much more intensive. And we put our main focus in more on the aspect of streets. And to do that, we've tried to take a more holistic approach and think of the street as an ecosystem. So you can see there on the diagram that um, point two, the carriageway and footway, they're the sort of basis on which the, if you like, the stage on which the drama of city life, uh, street life takes place. But on top of that, we've got the movement and activity uh, that we're really focusing on. We've got the buildings either side that actually attract people to those streets that actually give arise for demands for parking, loading and so on. We've got the subsurface activities, the metro, um, water and things like that would interact with the street and also we've got airspace above and uh, increasingly in the future drones. And so the question is how can we use this space um, in a way that's imaginative and of course COVID has actually helped with that because here are examples of streets on the left for example in Boston where it was just a, a, a road uh, with just general carriageway for general traffic, now it's being marked off with bus lanes and cycle lanes on the right, some of the street space has been taken up for a restaurant in order to encourage social distancing and so on. And this idea of using the space much more flexibly, uh, consultant Arab about the time we started our project did some work on what they call flexi curve and we're working with something similar to that but looking at the whole uh, width of the street from the building line to the building line. This is just a brief overview of the various elements of the work that we've been doing. Um, we started off with investigation and review looking at the state of the art around user needs, uh, the guides are available, the policies and indicators that are applied, looking particularly at political institutional organisation factors and the regulation and management of the street, which is so crucial, and also looking at future scenarios, new technologies, demographies and patterns of demand. Um, and today in our two sessions, we're going to focus on those three elements. Uh, we're going to give you some insights from uh, bits of work we've done there. Um, and then in, in a later event, in a month or two's time, we'll go on and talk about the design tools and the applications that we've, that we've gone through. So that's a quick overview uh, of more, an introduction. www.roadspace.eu um, is the website to go to, and we would encourage you to go there. There's a lot of really interesting material. So thank you. So now I'd like to start the first session. Um, and first of all, um, introduce Charlotte Holpen, who's going to talk about tactical urbanism uh, a way, as a way to overcome government's challenges to road space reallocation. And I'm going to stop sharing and hopefully Charlotte will be able to take over. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Peter. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm just going to um, start uh, sharing my screen um, and talk about tactical urbanism and the work we've been doing uh, on this topic as part of uh, the MOOL project. So here you go, you should be able to see, uh, to see my screen. Um, all right, so I'm Charlotte Halpern. I'm a researcher at Sciences Po in Paris. I work together with my colleagues, uh, Jenny McArthur from UCL, Francesco Sarti and Natalia Capellini from, from Sciences Po. And we've been working on this project. And one of the questions we've been asking ourselves 
um, has to do with, with governance and how to overcome governance challenges in order to address sweet space uh, reallocation. Obviously, part of the work we've been doing as part of some previous research, uh, also together with uh, Peter Jones, uh, working on, on CREATE was to uh, highlight uh, the number of mobility policies that are coexisting um, in a city in order to promote a different vision of what could be achieved and more specifically in order to reduce the role of the car. And we uh, highlighted as part of the CREATE project the slow shift from the car-oriented city uh, through that, uh, the sustainable mobility city in which public transport and cycle networks and road space reallocation is taking place towards a more city of place type of approach in which public uh, spaces um, uh, um, and, and mixed developments and new functionalities uh, for, for urban space is being introduced. And one of the questions uh, we asked ourselves as part of the MUL project was try to understand how is this shift taking place uh, more specifically uh, on the road, how to uh, uh, develop a city of places and how to make sure uh, this shift from the car oriented city and more specifically a network which is oriented towards the flow of cars, but also um, of, of more or less segregated use can, can transform itself into a more city of place approach. And obviously, in order to, to think about this, we need to uh, look at cities as places of movements and places. And in order to um, uh, take this into account, we identified uh, the need uh, to think in terms of governance and public challenge, public policy challenges, and to look uh, at those um, at those different elements taking place. So, what kind of challenges are we talking about when we think in terms of public policy and, and governance? Well, the first one, and we will dev be developing this in more details uh, in the rest of the session and this afternoon. But there are new demands, there are new users, there are new technologies, which constantly put some added pressure on uh, the urban network. Um, the urban road network is also incredibly complicated. I mean, this is uh, the, the network of Budapest, which is showing here on the screen, but uh, every city in the MOL project, I guess, within the EU context, has an incredibly um, shared, uh, a complicated institutional and organizational um, uh, uh, challenges when it comes to uh, street uh, authority, to uh, ownership, and to deciding who's going to uh, um, have access to the street and, and when and how and, and, and through what rules. And in order to um, uh, also better understand uh, this, this level of, 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 of mixed authority and, and ownership, uh, the divide is not just between public and private uh, um, um, uh, organizations, but it is also across levels between the city, the state, and sometimes the regions in, in federal states. Um, finally, um, when we think also about governance and public policy challenges, um, uh, thinking in terms of how to provide cities more power and more room for maneuver to overcome those challenges is also about capacity building and resource accumulation. So all in all, we thought about addressing those challenges in terms of governance in order to ensure coordination, how to think in terms of multiple subsystems being accommodated in order to uh, bring new demands for reallocating road and street space uh, on, the, on the network. And um, of course, the, the question we are asking ourselves while doing this was whether or not it was going to benefit to city authorities in the end, because of course, there's been other authorities uh, taking uh, taking uh, the role on this. And one of those tools that the cities have been developing in order to achieve just that, meaning to uh, strengthen urban governance as a way to change and organize this shift from a car-oriented city towards more uh, city of space, has been to throw on, on tactical uh, uh, urbanism. Um, in order to do that, and uh, this is maybe something that uh, is not so new for a number of you, tactical urbanism is indeed no new uh, solution. It is a very old idea that was developed in the 1960s. Uh, it's, it's already mentioned in the work um, of um, uh, people such as Jan Gill, for example, or Henri Lefebvre, or even Jane Jacobs mentions it. It's, so it's quite an old idea when it comes to urban planning to draw on small scale actions to transform urban space. And we saw over the time that a number of uh, measures were introduced, such as shared gardening and pop up plazas and reclaiming street space for urban life. Um, and the main goal for this uh, type of action is to prove uh, a number of uh, containers wrong, to prove uh, your national authorities that indeed 
uh, you can have uh, some mixed um, uh, users uh, on streets and new functions being developed on street space is also a, pray, a way to prove your citizens wrong, uh, that uh, it is indeed possible to allow for more space to be given to pedestrians and to, uh, and to cycling and maybe to take some parking spot slots uh, away. Uh, and it is also a way to prove a number of transport organizations wrong and technicians wrong that indeed it is possible uh, with maintaining a safe environment to introduce such changes. So it has become a preferred action repertoire for a number of urban activists. What we uh, highlighted in the case in the context of Moore is that not only is it a preferred action repertoire for activists, but it has become a preferred action repertoire for the cities themselves in order to achieve just what I was mentioning before and to overcome this particular challenge of trying to make sure that within this shift from car-oriented city towards a city of space, uh, city authorities would be uh, the um, organizations uh, being able to govern their own territory and to achieve this change and make sure this was going towards the goal uh, they were looking for. Uh, so in this context, tactical urbanism has become a solution to achieve long-term and transformative changes. Um, this uh, graph I saw on the, on the right, on the uh, left side of the screen, highlights uh, the shift in, in capacity building and policy resource accumulation that we witnessed in the CREATE project, in which we highlight especially the way through which cities such as Copenhagen and Paris has extensively drawn on tactical urbanism in the 1990s and 2000s in order to bring some transformative changes on those streets. And this has nothing to do just with the COVID crisis, which sort of accelerated and gave more visibility to the phenomenon, but it is a long-term process in which uh, small-scale experiments are becoming uh, the basis for citywide strategies for road um, space reallocation. And what I would like to finish on maybe, and this is my, my, my last uh, comment and maybe open for discussion, is that tactical urbanism is a very timely and instrumental solution in order to achieve set changes, but it is in no way uh, the, uh, the, the main and the only and sufficient uh, condition in order to achieve such uh, long-term uh, transformation. What we show as part of more is that in order for those so small scale experiments to deliver in terms of a citywide strategy, which is not just located in the urban core, but also extends to the periphery and to other cities across the country, uh, it has to uh, uh, adjust and, 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 and bring into some learning process and some capacity building in terms of city authorities learning on how to increase the capacity to govern uh, uh, road space. Uh, it is about engaging in epic legal and political battles, uh, sometimes with your national states, in order to uh, go in front of the courts. And this is something that we have witnessed in a number uh, of the cities uh, as part of the Mo project, who are ready to go uh, uh, into and to engage in those battles in order to ensure their growing power and role over uh, the governing of the road space. Um, transforming street space um, is also about introducing an in some institutionalized rules and norms and procedures in order to make sure that tactical urbanism can be uh, introduced for a longer term perspective mm. in the, um, in the uh, city area. And finally, uh, one of the main challenge for our cities has been to scale up uh, beyond the urban core. And this is not a, uh, this is not a small uh, challenge, but to make sure that uh, uh, small scale interventions can transform not just uh, the busy shopping streets uh, or those areas where the most value is created through the development of uh, 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 mixed use, but that it can also benefit some of the wider uh, um, areas uh, in the city and those located at the fringes of it. Um, so in order to uh, in, think about this, um, uh, this aspect, uh, one of the key lessons and key findings from Moore is that yes, tactical urbanism can be uh, fully uh, integrated and included in the city's tactics and strategy uh, to transform the city from a car-oriented city toward a city as place type of city, uh, but in order to do that, uh, there needs to be some scaling up taking place uh, in terms of capacity building, in terms of policy resource mobilization, in terms of gaining more power progressively in a very incremental way, but step by step making sure that cities and city government uh, maintain authority and strengthen their governance ability to uh, um, um, make this change operational. Um, in, 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 the, in the process. So 
Um, I'm happy to answer some questions and uh, we'll have some presentations later on this morning uh, from the cases of Budapest, uh, from uh, Lisbon, sorry, and Malmö, who will be uh, explaining how they have been through this process and presenting one specific program in more, in more details. And we have some colleagues also from uh, pedestrians and, and cyclist users just going to explain how they have been part also of the process through which uh, this road space has been transformed and by which urban governance has played quite a big role in the process. Um, so thank you very much for your attention and uh, look forward to uh, listening to my colleague Regine Gericke who will be speaking about the more operational and practical side of things. Thank you very much, Charlotte. And I'd just like to wel pe welcome people who've joined us since we started this morning to, to this uh, event around the Moore project. So yes, I'm going to screw straight on now to uh, our second speaker, who's uh, Regina Gerike from Technical University of Dresden, who's going to talk to us about guidelines and indicators for a fair and efficient allocation of road space in cities. Thank you, Regina. Over to you. Good morning, everybody. Welcome also from my side. Uh, can you see the slides and can you hear me well? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Okay. So my name is Regine Gericke. Uh, thank you for introducing uh, my person, Peter. Uh, I'm working as a professor for transport planning and traffic engineering in Dresden in uh, Germany. So you see, we are really an interdisciplinary team here in the MORE project. And in the next 10 minutes, I would like to invite you uh, to visit a specific street section in Germany and to discuss with the help of this uh, example, uh, challenges and also opportunities for future urban street design for meeting all the requirements from the dif different usages and user groups. So let's have a look at our example. This is the Hahnenstraße in Kerpen. So you see here two photos and uh, one cross section from the before situation. So obviously they have redesigned the street and this is as it looked like before the redesign. So let's have a look. Uh, this is a typical, very typical street in a small German town and shopping street in the city center. We have a road around eight to 10,000 cars per day, 600 cyclists per day and 140 buses. There's no tram line in this street section. So how does this look like? Let's start with the carriageway. So we have 6.50 uh, meters for the carriageway. This is a standard carriageway width in Germany. And this is the same in many other countries. What we have found in the more project. Then we have, uh, when you have the design vehicles, um, bus, bus or uh, lorries uh, as the design vehicles. Mm, then we have parking lanes on both sides of the street and the width of these is two meter 20. So this is wider than required in uh, Germany. We only um, have two meters as a standard width for such a parking lane in uh, Germany. And we have found similar values in other countries, but some countries also have increased values up to two meter 25. Mm. And then we have the cyclist and the pedestrian, both of the carriageway. And you see the mm, widths here for the pedestrians, it's one meter 40 here and one meter 90 here. And then we have one meter 15, one meter 10 for the cyclist. And you see here, when you look at the photo, there's a marking in between the cyclists and the mm, pedestrians. And then we have a buffer space between the cyclists and the parked cars of 30 five centimeters. So what are your thoughts when you look at this cross section? What would be your opinion? I have marked uh, four issues here, two in red, two in green. So the carriageway, this is a standard one. This is fine. Uh, the width of the parking lanes is fine. Uh, this is what cars need, cars get bigger, but 2.20 um, meters is fine. But what is not fine is uh, to put cyclists and pedestrian both on, on a uh, sidewalk that is uh, 2.50 meter wide overall. And then there's really a serious problem uh, with this buffer space also. Yeah? So you have conflicts between, uh, or you might expect conflicts between pedestrians and cyclists because space is not enough uh, for them. 
Mm, and then we have a serious problem, safety problem, uh, because the buffer space should be 75 centimeters yeah, between uh, cyclists and parked cars. So this, these are problems. And now let's look at what solutions stakeholders have, de have developed for this um, situation. So this is what uh, the new solution looks like. And I put here two cross sections now, because you see on the, on the lower part of this slide here that um, the street layout differs. Yeah, So I, they have developed different solutions for different parts of this street section. So we have here a street section with a medium strip. Here there's no medium strip. strip. You see a crossing facility, you see uh, alternating parking and, and greenery and, and also access to the adjacent build and buildings and, and usages um, on this part of the street. And you see that the sidewalks are smaller here and, and wider here where there is no medium strip. Um, and in, in the upper part of the slide, you see one cross section, this one here at this uh, point, and then another one here with a medium strip. So now let's look at this solution with our planners view and expertise. Mm. We see that now cyclists are in the carriage way and they have an advisory lane. Uh, this is a solution that uh, many countries uh, provide in their regulatory uh, framework. Mm. So these are advisory lanes that uh, are compulsory to be used or cyclists are required, requested to use these uh, advisory lanes but motorized vehicles are also allowed to use them when they do not interfere uh, with uh, cyclists. So the width of this advisory lane on both sides is 1 meter 25. And then we have in between uh, 4 meter 50 left for the cars. We have uh, still parking lanes. Uh, the widths have been reduced to 2 meters to the standard value. And then we have the sidewalks only for the pedestrians now. This is 3.50 here, 2 meters here, 2 meters and 2 meters. So this differs and we see this on the lower part of the um, slide. And then we have here, similarly, the advisory lanes and the medium strip in the middle. So what are your thoughts and idea when you look at this new solution? So I have uh, marked quite some issues here, uh, two in green, but far more in red. So it's great that the pedestrians have their own space now and 3.50 meters, really good seeing that this is also a shopping street. Yeah, and we have really usages uh, and place activities here in this uh, street. Um, the width of the parking lane is also fine. The width of the, the advisory lane is still not enough. So when we look at the international guidelines and, and frameworks, um, and also in Germany, uh, this is really a, a minimum, minimum value. So normally it should be at least uh, 1.50 meters, these advisory lanes for cyclists. And then the space in between, 4 meter 50, is also quite narrow. Uh, this is even not sufficient for two cars meeting. So even when two cars meet here, then they have to use the space provided for the cyclists. And this is even more the case when two buses meet or a bus and a car or a lorry and a car and a lorry and a lorry. And then we have um, a serious safety issues issue again with a buffer space uh, for uh, between the pedestrian pedestrians and between the cyclists for um, be and the parked cars. Yeah, So there's no buffer space. This is marked here. There's no buffer space between the parked cars and the advisory lane. And this is really an issue because the advisory lane is so narrow. And there is no um, buffer space to the pedestrians. Um, this should be at least 2 meter 50 yeah, to have 50 meters buffer space here to the walking area for the pedestrians. Mm, what else? The medium strip should better be 2.50 meters yeah, for um, cyclists uh, who wait there. Mm, yeah, these are the issues. So this is uh, also not an optimal case. Yeah. So when we now look at ah, some, some photos for you to get an impression, you have seen the photos from the before situation. So this looks really nicer now. Yeah, you see the different uh, material, you see the medium strip, the advisory lane, how they uh, have designed the parking lane and the greenery in between. So this 
looks really uh, good. And uh, you see the crossing facility here, you see that the lorry is, needs to use the space yeah, provided for the cyclists. Mm, you see how the pedestrian used this medium strip um, and that this is really comfortable for um, crossing the street. You see place activities yeah, that have their space now here. You see also some illegal use of the new street layout because uh, cyclists are supposed to use this advisory lane. Perhaps they do not feel safe yeah? or uh, there might be other reasons why they still cycle on the sidewalk. Okay, so now this is the old and the new solution. What, what do we learn from this very specific um, example? And the most important lesson learned is uh, that um, street, is, um, limit, street, street space is limited, particularly in inner urban areas. And that uh, street designs that we develop are always compromises and that we, uh, our task is to find and to optimize these compromises again and again and new for each um, design task and, and uh, application that we are supposed to um, work on. So uh, some principles that might be helpful for these uh, challenging tasks for finding, finding solutions for these um, really various usages and user groups. Mm. The first one, one is- One minute, Regina, please. One minute, yeah. sorry. The first one is uh, road function classification is really important to make clear the prior priorities for the different uh, user groups, to formulate clear goals and priorities and also performance indicator. Do you want to have a cycling city, cycling street, or public transport more important, or the place activities? This helps to find compromises. Stakeholder engagement is very important. And of course, um, we need to ensure the compliance with the standards. When the standards provide um, or require buffer spaces, this has a reason. What can more help you in finding these solutions? We provide you with a rich collection of uh, international material on road function classification, performance indicators, guidelines, good practice example, and far more. Please visit our website to learn about our products and insights. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Regina. Um, and I think that makes the point very nicely that uh, within more, um, at the end of the day, we're very much interested in what happens on the ground, how you actually use the space, how you manage the space and so on. But as Regina said, that there are no perfect solutions, often in busy streets, it's a matter of compromise and, and balance. And that really goes back very much, I think, to Charlotte's presentation uh, in terms of um, uh, you know, the fact that it is very much about, about governance and, and about the whole framework within which that's done. Um, actually, perhaps I could kick off with a, a quick uh, question. Actually, Charlotte, there's lots of talk about car wars and cycle wars and things like that. Um, and obviously, that, there are various elements to that. There's the, the political landscape, there's the sort of citizens uh, pressure growing um, groups there. And there's also the way in which the administration is organised and the governments and so on. What, what role do you think those different things have either in facilitating this sort of confrontation or in actually helping to deal with it? Are, are there are some cities better at handling inevitable conflict than others? Is it down to governments or what do you think it's down to? Should I answer right away, Peter? Or Please, we... yeah, yeah. Right, so I think as always, it works both ways, I would say. And um, I think um, and in some, in some cities, um, uh, this type of approach and tactical urbanism has been incredibly useful in order to demonstrate on the ground uh, to all the different parties involved that such an approach was indeed feasible because for a number of people, um, uh, the feasibility um, of um, um, uh, shared users, for example, or, or mixed traffic wasn't uh, uh, imaginable, or the fact that uh, you could uh, remove a number of parking slots without causing a major riot was also something that was quite difficult to imagine. So in some cities, this approach has been quite uh, useful, and it has led uh, to demonstrating uh, the, 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 the used and added value of this. Um, in other cases, it has cost uh, mayors the, the, the position. Uh, it has been uh, uh, quite um, uh, um, uh, problematic to handle, one would say, from a political perspective, because uh, um, um, uh, move, well, 
um, citizens have been able to regroup themselves. Uh, some um, uh, shopkeepers could have also been able to um, uh, organize themselves. We can think more specifically about the Norbrogad um, in, in Copenhagen, which we studied as part of the CREATE project, uh, in which uh, such, uh, such um, a result was, was seen. Uh, in other cities, uh, it has been, such as the case of Paris, for example, or in the case of Lisbon, um, some more uh, lengthy negotiation, one could say. So technical urbanism and one specific measure could be a way to open the discussion between the three major players, um, the citizen on the one hand, the politicians and the technicians. And as you know, um, politicians will always say that engineers and citizens are, um, do not understand the beauty of, of, of uh, uh, mixed and, and sharing streets and, and uh, engineers put the, 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 say that politicians don't understand it and the citizens say that uh, politicians and uh, engineers are too backward thinking in their head. So I think it's mainly about those three groups acknowledging the fact through this kind of measure that it is indeed feasible and the challenge, I guess, for this type of measure afterwards and for the city itself is then to decide uh, how to institutionalize it and make it more permanent. And this is where I think uh, capacity building and learning from the process is absolutely uh, useful because maybe it is not useful in every part of the of the city to be uh, permanently installed and it needs to be renegotiated um, through some um, uh, specific uh, methods and procedures uh, with public debate, for example. Sorry, I've been a bit long. Okay. No, that's lovely. Thank you very much. Um, the question came up in the chat about how to make streets more walkable. And Regina, I noticed that when you presented your figures on the use of that street, you didn't have any pedestrian figures. And that's not a criticism of you. I think that's often the case. It's very easy to get figures on the number of buses or cars or cyclists and much more difficult to get figures on pedestrians. And do you think that lack of information about what pedestrians are actually doing, what their needs are, in a sense, perhaps means that we undervalue and we perhaps don't always uh, take account of walkability as much as we should do. Yeah, this is really a main reason. So they simply don't know, is would be my best guess, yeah, how many pedestrians they have and, and what place activities. Um, but still you see that they have worked on this in this example. So they have increased the space for place activities and for walking and they have um, integrated more crossing facilities also. So I think uh, priority, more priority is given to place activities and pedestrians, but still we have the problem. We do not have numbers on them. So we hardly can tell any success stories also before and after. And this is really a problem, yeah, because you have plenty of this information, yeah, for cars and uh, motorized vehicles. Mm. And of course, pedestrians are far more flexible. So when you have your design vehicle, this is so fixed, yeah, this needs some space and the pedestrian is so flexible, yeah. Um, and of course, this makes us it challenging. Now, looking back to Charlotte, yeah, in the negotiation uh, of the different um, requirements from the different user groups to make a strong vote for pedestrians and for place activities and to really succeed, yeah, in an increasing space for them. Okay, thank you. Uh, Francesco, have we had yes. any? Yes, uh, Peter, we do have some, uh, it depends on how much time do we have. We have We've got time for one, I think, sorry. Okay, one. so um, a question from uh, um, Remy Holm from, uh, from Belgium, which I'll put on screen. Says, I see that pedestrians cross everywhere, even outside pedestrian crossings. Uh, and he's asking whether they have priority over cars in Germany. Shall I answer this, Peter? Simon oh, well, Morgan yeah, si Simon's our expert. He's going to talk next, but yes, go on, Simon. Uh, I think the answer is no, they don't have priority. But unlike in the United States, there's very little legislation against jaywalking. So you're allowed to cross the road as a pedestrian almost anywhere you like in Europe, but you don't have priority over cars. So you take yeah, the risk, basically. You only have priority when you have these zebra stripes exactly. or when you have a signaling, in, but, but in, with indeed. this medium strip, they have to wait. Uh, we do not have these nice um, meeting zones, zones de rencontre, <laughs> begegnungszonen uh, in Germany in our legal framework uh, that um, exist in Austria, in Switzerland and in France, this we do not have. Thanks a lot. And um, Peter, we also have a, a remark from uh, Helmut Holt sure. Apfel. Can we yeah. answer? Can we ask him to take the floor for a second, or do you think uh, we have enough time for that? Well, we're, we're just up on time, actually. We haven't really got time to do that. I'm sorry, Helmut. 
Um, but if okay. you, uh, so, perhaps if you can write your comment, if we get time later on, we'll pick it up then, because I'm just conscious we've got so many speakers this morning, I want to give them all, all a fair chance. So okay. I'd just like to thank uh, Charlotte Regina very much for uh, kicking this off this morning. I think giving us a spectrum from the actual practicalities of how you do it on the ground through to a whole political, organisational, uh, citizen context in which, in which that debate takes place. So thank you both very much indeed. So I'm going to move on to the second session now, and the first speaker is Simon Morgan, uh, who's uh, Director of Buchanan uh, Computing. Uh, you've heard from him just now, and he's going to talk about what scope for cities initiatives in a highly regulated framework and using new technology to communicate with human drivers. So thank you very much. Over to you, Simon. Right, thank you, thank you, Peter, and good morning, everybody. Uh, yes, as Peter says, I, I'm uh, Director and Chairman of Buchanan Computing, which is the successor company to the, that founded by Professor Sir Colin Buchanan back in the 1960s, for those of you who remember his famous report, Traffic in Towns. Uh, but we focus on training and uh, software and reg traffic regulation, in particular, in, and traffic signing in, in the UK and now throughout Europe. So I'm in the more project uh, for two reasons, but this morning to talk about regulatory measures and what we found as part of the more project uh, in terms of what's going on at the moment, and in particular, what might and is needed to happen in the future. So I'm going to be talking about what is meant by traffic regulation, uh, the challenges uh, and the changes that are coming up, how we meet these with innovations, how we plan for the future, particularly with a mix of human drivers and potentially autonomous or semi-autonomous vehicles in the future. So first off, what do we mean by traffic regulation? I'm confining myself to local traffic regulation, that is to say measures that differ from place to place because national legislation on vehicle safety, wearing seat belts, which side of the road you drive on and so on, is fairly well observed and well understood and doesn't require any particular local signing. But it's the measures that differ from place to place and particularly when they differ by time of day that are more problematic for communicating these to the human or the autonomous driver. So first off, may a particular vehicle use a road at all? Is the road network actually available to me at this time of day? or for the purpose I'm planning to use it for. And so here's a couple of examples of uh, roads that are not available to motor vehicles or not to lorries, except for certain specified purposes on the plate underneath the sign. And that's quite a common measure. And in this category, I would lump also the new clean air or low emission zones that are coming in throughout Europe, where vehicles that emit more than a certain uh, amount of um, CO2 or particulates are not allowed in or only allowed in if they pay an extra charge. So these are zonal restrictions that actually stop you using the road altogether. Then if you are allowed in on the road, what about the way in which you must drive? Clearly speed limits fall into this category and they're well signed across Europe. How fast are you allowed to drive on this section of road? Can you overtake? Do you have to uh, keep box junctions clear uh, at intersections to avoid uh, causing uh, obstruction, all those sort of measures don't affect whether you use the road or not. Um, and they don't really affect very much the function of each bit of road space either. They're more to do with how you should drive for safety reasons and for good congestion reasons. Then we move on to things that the Moore Project is uh, concerned with, like allocation of road space within each link, such as bus lanes, cycle lanes, um, separating the vehicle streams from uh, oncoming traffic and so on. Space specifically for queuing, I don't think we've looked at very much in the Moore project, but uh, some people have for projects that they call queue re relocation, that uh, where you think traffic queuing is inevitable, you make sure it's in the optimum place. Then there is uh, the idea of um, tidal flow and the fact that this might vary at different times of day that you might change which lanes are for which direction of flow, depending on uh, uh, when the congestion is greatest and where the vehicle flows are highest. And then you might reserve uh, lanes for car sharing for higher vehicles carrying a higher number of people uh, to uh, maximize capacity and to encourage that sort of uh, car sharing. Then the curbside is to do with the place function of the street. What do we need to do to enable people to use the street 
as their workplace, as their retail place or as their home, what activities are needed for them to get in and out of their vehicles, to load goods, have deliveries and so on. And so this is a whole separate area of regulation. Basically, do we allow vehicles to stop at the curbside? And if so, for how long or for what purpose? And as you see on the sign on the left, what do we, might you happen to you if you disobey those regulations? So what's happening in the future is there's more competition for all areas of road space, both along the curbside and moving vehicle space. And of course, there is contention between those two more curbside loading space, for example, means less space for through traffic and vice versa, or for uh, place functions such as planters and seating and uh, trees and things. And there is a need for authorities across Europe to have a financial payback, almost entirely the best forms of regulation of parking certainly involve the civic authorities themselves doing the enforcement rather than the police force, and usually getting some sort of payback retaining some or all of the uh, fees and penalty charges which helped fund the enforcement efforts. So that's quite a major driver towards the uh, good enforcement of traffic measures. Then I've alluded briefly to dynamic restrictions. What do we do if things vary at different times of day? And then the increasing need to have in-vehicle IT and artificial intelligence, both to help the human driver and also for uh, autonomous or connected vehicles as well. Then many applications need some national data set for the vehicle to reference to make sense of the traffic rules that apply in particular areas. But there are differences in standards, both traffic signing, traffic legislation, uh, what are the rules both across Europe and even within countries sometimes that are um, a break on some of these changes. So what do we do about time dependent restrictions. Well, if they're simply at predefined times, the signing can say so, as you see there, that uh, it's permanent signing, but it just tells you what times these restrictions operate, even in multiple languages if necessary. But if things are dynamic, depending upon demand or weather, congestion and so on, such as these variable speed limits, then you need dynamic signing that is not fixed in time, it can change at any moment or with a minute's uh, warning or whatever, whatever the national legislation says and depending on the nature of the restriction. And that makes enforcement difficult. It makes uh, communication with the vehicle, both human drivers and connected vehicles, both difficult. And that is quite a challenge for the future. Here's another one, experimental, where uh, the bus lane could operate at different times on different days of the week because it's dependent upon these markings lighting up in the road to tell you that you may use the bus lane and it's dependent on the, that vertical sign is a variable message sign. It's a rotating prism that can rotate to show a different message when the bus lane is not in use. So there are some technologies available and this one is, is sort of 15 years old. They have been available for some time but not widely used because they're expensive and difficult to maintain. But here's one I'll just finish off with that's brand new coming online at uh, uh, Southwark in uh, South of the River Thames in London, where uh, this is a space that is for different purposes at different times of day. You can see it's surfaced for use as pedestrian space when it's not being used for loading, but to enable the shops and to be serviced, there are certain times of day when it can be used for loading. And that loading function can be just for pre-booked vehicles as well. It says authorised permit holders only. So you can, by virtue of the smaller signs underneath, which are controlled by mobile phone signal 4G or 3G, um, sorry, 5G or 4G, and uh, solar panels, so the thing doesn't need any extra connection to the mains electricity. Uh, this is a technology that's actually about to go live anytime soon, but actually has variable message on the sign at the bottom to say who, if anybody, is allowed to load at that particular time. And so that can vary in accordance with conditions and what has been booked. So the future is um, how do we communicate with connected autonomous vehicles and human dis readable displays in vehicles? And it's via phone networks. Uh, but it needs uh, data in the vehicle as well to back the system up when the signal fails, because you're not going to get a mobile signal all the time. 
But an alternative to that, and the one which is actually more widely adopted at the moment, is camera technology with uh, forward-facing cameras on vehicles trying to pick up the road signs. Uh, but that's got its own inherent problems. It requires a very high level of maintenance for signing, plus it's prone to errors, people picking up uh, things that are not traffic signs and uh, misinterpreting the signs that are there. So there's advantages and disadvantages in both those approaches, but it's just to, to highlight there are essentially two ways to go, either some sort of national repository of traffic rules that can be picked up by in-vehicle systems or a very high level of on-street signing that the uh, AI in the vehicles can fully understand and interpret. So that's the end of my session. So I hope that was interesting. Just a quick taster of some of the things we've been looking at in more in the regulatory strand. Thanks for your interest. Thanks very much indeed, Simon. I'd like to stress how important this is because on these busy streets with lots of conflicting demands and pressures, it very much depends on, on regulating the use of that space. And to be effective, that needs to be well signed so people understand the regulation and also need to be well informed. So the, the, this thing is really crucial to make the whole thing work. So thank you very much indeed, Simon. The other two presentations in this session uh, are going to deal with uh, the sort of vulnerable and one would say perhaps the more neglected user groups, pedestrians and cyclists. So first of all, I'm going to introduce Mar uh, Mario Alves, who is president of the International Federation of Pedestrians, who's going to talk about pedestrian quality needs walking the talk. So thank you very much, Mario. Over to you. You're on, Mario, you're on mute. We can't hear you. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. I was just trying to find where was the <laughs> my window. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to, yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. I'm actually Secretary General. I, I think our president is uh, watching us somewhere. Um, so I will be speaking about uh, pedestrian. Good morning, everybody. And um, as Peter said, and uh, as you remarked, uh, we are sometimes forgotten and not counted. So um, I will speak about. The pedestrians and one thing that is quite important about pedestrians is that in fact we are 100 percent uh even people getting out of a car or getting out of a bike uh are uh, is a pedestrian so um i took this po photo from my hotel window when everybody was hyper mobile and you could see that pedestrians are indeed uh, cut by a thousand cuts and uh, this is actually a, an interesting slide that you can see is a comment in the democracy of our public space that a garage that is probably used Used once a week or once a day uh, cuts and uh, makes people run away from their natural environment, which is the sidewalk. Um, and just a very quick um, mention of the International Federation of Pedestrians. We are almost 60 years old, so we are quite old, and we have about 50 organizations worldwide, about 20 uh, in, the Europe, in most European countries, with 26 NGOs in Europe. Um, so what is a pedestrian? I think that's an interesting question. And uh, especially because the word pedestrian in English is a little bit pejorative. You have pedestrian ideas, ideas that are, you know, very simple, but in fact, um, pedestrians should be the basis and uh, um, the glue of uh, public transport systems and all the systems in, in uh, as a whole. So one of the things that is very important when we are shifting um, the paradigm is that language also should change. And we can see that. And I could see that, for example, I was very pleased that here our audience was very worried about pedestrians in our first questions. Um, so one of the things that we note is that, of course, we should stop speaking about non-motorized modes to speak about uh, cyclists and, uh, and pedestrians. And we should speak about active modes, which are uh, highlights the, um, the benefits for health and for the environment, which uh, is probably a, a good thing. One thing that we note is that sometimes we are bunched together like cyclists and pedestrians, and we are very difficult, different animals with different needs. And we are friends with each other. We like to share space when it's large and comfortable, but uh, we are very different from cyclists. Um, 
one thing that is very important for pedestrians is uh, two characteristics, universality and vulnerability. I will speak only about universality because it's less known or less think, thought about. Universality means that you really cannot generalize about pedestrians. When someone says that pedestrians are too slow uh, walking across uh, the lanes or using the zebra crossing, you know, when you're generalizing, usually you are doing an error. And I think this is very important when we're talking about campaigns uh, towards pedestrians, because we are talking about a child that is three, four years old, uh, an elderly with Alzheimer. So we have a variety of people that are pedestrians. The other thing is, I already said, is we are taking for granted. We are 100%, which is strong in terms of voting and political power. But at the same time, we are very weak in terms of advocacy, not as strong as the, the cyclists that sometimes are 10%, uh, 5%, and very, very strong in terms of uh, lobbying. And I am a cyclist activist myself. The other thing that's very important is safety, and I will come back to that in the end of my presentation. And, and there you have also to change the language. And uh, we really don't like to use the word accident. Accident is just a very, very small percentage of the crashes. Uh, accidents are not at, uh, you know, crashes are not act of God, of God. And I think even in the scientific terms, it's better to speak about collisions and all kinds of uh, different kinds of uh, incidents or uh, crashes. And the other thing that Peter already mentioned is the, the need to, to, to measure um, pedestrians, how many pedestrians and their comfort and quality. So walkability measures, there are many tools worldwide and I think you should start using walkability before and after projects because then that's the way to measure if pedestrians are being well treated. And of course there is the benefits of walking and I will not speak about it because it's quite obvious for everybody. But it's just showing you the next slide just to see how complex and diverse uh, it means to be a pedestrian. You see uh, even prams are pedestrians uh, people on wheelchairs are pedestrians, and I think it's a very, very important to understand, especially if we we're speaking about the future. If you start imagining drones in this environment or uh, delivery robots, you can see that there is very, very strong ch challenges that I will speak later. So what is our main problem? Our main problem, probably speed, and I, I don't speak obviously the problem with speed is um, safety uh, and discomfort but also uh, there are two things that are not often spoke about speed which is the space that speak, uh, speed occupies a car with uh, at 50 kilometers per hour occupies uh, 120 square meters and there are not many families that have 120 square meters to live uh, in their everyday life but also when you are at 50 kilometers per hour your tunnel of vision is much smaller so you really don't connect and don't look at shops and don't know exactly what's going on in the street you don't see pedestrians and even the, the social capital of the of the driver is smaller because you don't really connect with your environment and i think this is very very important so what is the actual and the future needs of pedestrians? I will speak very quickly about quality of public space, which is quite obvious, good pavement, trees, shade, with climate change is very important, benches, it's our parking spaces, benches are very, very important with elderly Europe, you know, uh, the percentage of elderly is increasing, active frontages to make it the walking interesting, you can walk more if you have active frontages, if you have like blind frontages, it's boring and you don't like to be there, and about safety, lower speeds, abandonment, abundant uh, safe crossings, air quality and noise. I think they, these are the elements I would like to sp speak about. Uh, pedestrians usually are forgotten and this is horrendous. This is an attack on democracy on public space. Enforcement is very, very important. This should not happen. Um, another thing is the quality of public space is very important. 75% of pedestrians getting to the hospital are not are just because of falls. And this is not even considered a road safety hazard. So it's not in road safety um, statistics according to the Vienna Convention. So that's something that we should address uh, the quality of the pavement that is comfortable for wheelchair, wheelchairs and all kinds of pedestrians. The other thing is about air quality and noise. Of course, this is discomfort. This is this disencourage pedestrians to use public space, but it's very strongly related with social equity. And when we're talking about major roads crossing streets to get their ports like Moore is studying, it's very, very important to understand that most of the time we are crossing uh, 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 very poor areas that are very, very much burdened with uh, noise and pollution. And I think this, uh, this problem of transport justice should be addressed very, very neatly. 
So what are the future challenges? I will just mention two uh, autonomous vehicles, and I think it's uh, much farther future, but I think it's coming here and we are discussing in international forums constantly about this. And I think for the, the safety of the most vulnerable, the pedestrian should be the centerpiece of the debate. And I think when you see simulations of autonomous vehicles, sometimes they don't even have pedestrians. So these pedestrians are invisible to the technology sometimes. And the other thing is micromobility. And I think we should see, say strongly that motorized vehicles should not be allowed on sidewalks with the exception of motorized wheelchairs, which are pedestrians, of course. So this is a major challenge for us. This is, should not happen. And um, we should start uh, redistributing public space with micro-mobility micro lanes and so on. So enforcement is very, very important. And we should be very careful with this. And of course, the future um, that is now with COVID, with all these deliveries coming up, there is a lot of companies putting millions on, uh, on this kind of robots. And this, for example, when we're talking about people with uh, sight difficulties or even blind, it's very, very complex. But even any pedestrian, this is a very, very um, troubling uh, situation. And I, I have to say that these devices for, for Europe, where we ambition 30 kilometer uh, per hour uh, cities, they probably should be on the on the on the road on the tarmac. Um, that's uh, something that we can talk about uh, in the future. So very quickly now, examples of good practice. Uh, I will not speak about tactical urbanism too much. I just give you an example. Space state space wise planning. I gave you the example of super blocks, public space, parklets, and uh, classic traffic calming. So uh, as Charlotte already spoke, I'm not going to say what is very very important about uh, the tactical urbanism is to experiment and to show people how streets can be can change. There is a lot of um, things being done now. I'll just show you a very major road in Freiburg uh, that was transformed the weekend so could, people can could, um, could experiment how uh, a road can be very different from what they are used to. So that's a very, very powerful statement, uh, a political statement for the street. Uh, the other thing is, uh, um, and uh, Peter already spoke is about, uh, and this is related also to COVID, is how to transform uh, parking places in uh, sitting places and sitting places that can be e even for parklets that are public and not attached to a commercial uh, outlet. So I think this is very important if people want just to sit down and not be, uh, be need to pay to sit down and drink something. And I think those examples are very important. I just call to the attention, this was a grassroots uh, initiative with the parking day, but then cities with the crisis of uh, 2011 started to build and to regulate these parklets. And I think this is very, very important for the future. One, one minute. It, Mario. One okay, minute. yes. The other thing I would like to show you is that when we are planning for major roads, uh, we are actually can actually start doing environmental zones from Buchanan, as uh, Simon already mentioned. Uh, we can have this uh, 30 zones or environmental zones that actually you can do it like that. You just do um, a continuous sidewalk. And if you do a continuous sidewalk, you are uh, making comfort for pedestrians, you're making slower speeds for uh, cyclists, and uh, you are protecting the zone. So make sure that the zebra crossing is on the natural path of the pedestrians. Make sure you reduce the radius when you get into the neighborhood so that cars reduce the speed and pedestrians are less exposed. Uh, do um, the um, meet um, ref refuges with space uh, as uh, um, uh, was mentioned before. And just, uh, this is the last slide. Um, one thing, how this conceptually can be, and we have been talking since the last four years, how Vision Zero should be uh, updated. And uh, one of the things that we should update is to focus on model shift because ambitioning uh, that you are not being killed in the public space is not really a very, very strong ambition. So political choice is key here. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mario. Thank you. I know you're trying to pack in a lot there. It's very, very, very interesting. So I'm going to go straight on to the, the last presentation uh, for cycling, uh, which is being given by Alexandra Wojcinski from the European uh, Cycling Federation. So over to you, Alexandra. Alexandra thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, well, cycling has been traditionally considered a very local issue, and uh, most of the cycle trips are indeed uh, 
relatively short and most of the decisions are taken on the local or at best regional level. But what I would like to show in this uh, short presentation is uh, that higher level legislation and policies can affect how easy or how difficult is it for local or regional authorities to provide a coherent uh, high quality uh, cycling network. So I would like to show a few examples how the development of uh, cycling infrastructure is affected by uh, the national and the European level. Uh, first, let's start with the national legislation. Uh, the range of solutions, the range of tools that the cities have available for them uh, is very heavily affected uh, on by the national legislation for signs and signals. What signs are there available for uh, to put on the roads and what are the conditions to, to put them on the roads? What, what, uh, what has to be met? I took this uh, picture on the right side in Brussels in Belgium and 10 years ago, uh, none of those free signs that you see would be would have an uh, equivalent or uh, similar sign in, in in my country in poland uh, so in the frame of the more project we looked at the legislation of 11 countries and uh, 11 so cycle friendly solutions how they are treated in this uh, in this uh, legislation I would like to, I will use uh, one of those elements, uh, contraflow cycling, as an example. Uh, contraflow cycling bases on an idea that, uh, well, you have a street that is uh, too narrow for cars moving into two different directions, but you can allow a car and a bicycle to pass. Uh, it's very useful often to provide an alternative route on local roads, uh, so you don't uh, have to go cycling on a busy main road. And as, as you can see, the signs uh, for contraflow cycling, they differ a bit between countries. That's not the problem. What is more interesting is what conditions the city, the municipality uh, has uh, to put those this kind of signs of the road. Uh, usually two main parameters are used uh, for the carriageway width and the traffic speed. And if you compare, for example, Belgium and Italy, you see that uh, if you have, for example, a four meters uh, street with 30 kilometers per hour speed limit, it would be obligatory for the local authorities to allow contraflow cycling on this. In Italy, it would be forbidden. But of course, Italy is not the worst case scenario. There are also countries that don't have any legal provisions uh, for that. Uh, so the cities, the municipalities have to uh, look for a different, uh, probably more expensive or uh, requiring more space uh, solution. Uh, moving on to the European level, uh, there is a trans-European transport network of major roads, railways, inland waterways which connects different European countries. And uh, when we first started showing some interest in that, uh, we were often questioned what, what, what does it have to do with cycling? It's some just motorways in the middle of nowhere. It's uh, nothing for cyclists there. But we have seen hundreds of even thousands of examples where the uh, Denti, big Denti projects, for example, motorway construction can uh, sabotage cycle routes or even the whole networks. Uh, this is a quite old example. This is the city of Seged. You can see a well-developed network of cycle routes on the right in the, in the city center. And you can see um, a cycle route connecting the city to the towns of Domasek and Morahalom on the left side. Uh, it's broken in the middle because of the construction of motorway between Budapest and Belgrade. The, the, the designers, they also had this approach that this motorway in the middle of nowhere, they don't have to think about cycling infrastructure. And now we are stuck with a very um, expensive and difficult problem to solve, how to connect back the suburbs to the, to the uh, city center. Of course, there are also good examples, examples of good practice, how uh, TENTI projects were used as an opportunity to improve uh, conditions for cycling. And we would like to see it more often and uh, as a rule rather than exception. 
Uh, the good news is that uh, it's already been recognized on the European level uh, with the update of the Directive on Road Infrastructure Safety Management in 2019. There's a new article that obliges the member states to ensure that the needs of vulnerable road users, that's pedestrians and cyclists, are taken into account in the implementation of the procedures. And there are quite a few details in the annexes to the directive that uh, explain what does it actually mean to take into account the needs of pedestrians and cyclists, how to, how to do it. We think that is a very good basis for the, uh, for, the for the ongoing revision of the 10 t guidelines, the regulation uh, for uh, European regulation, which addresses the, how the 10 t network should be developed. The, these uh, provisions should be uh, first uh, integrated into the guidelines, last extended from uh, roads, because the recent directive only affects roads to other modes of uh, transport. Uh, so the, the good news is that there, there, are, there is ongoing revision. We have uh, detailed proposals uh, how to how to improve the situation, and uh, we're working on getting it uh, integrated. Uh, one last slide about uh, the recovery and resilience facility. Uh, you probably have heard about it quite a few times. This is the famous 700 billion uh, funding available for uh, European recovery from the COVID pandemic. And uh, there are very strong signals from the European Commission that uh, bicycle infrastructure is the kind of project that is very welcome in this, uh, in this funding line. Uh, but well, to get this money, you have to ask for it. So, the, the, so you need to uh, have projects and you need to include them in the national uh, plans that are currently finalized or even submitted uh, to the European uh, Commission. So this is a very good example how the different uh, levels of governance are coming together. EU is providing uh, funding uh, framework, uh, but cities need to come with good uh, projects and the uh, countries, the national governments, they need to put them together into coherent plans and to accompany them, but uh, by sometimes by necessary uh, legislative uh, reforms. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Thank you, that's really interesting. Um, unfortunately, Simon uh, Morgan has had to leave uh, for another urgent meeting, so he won't be here for the panel discussion, so it'll be Mario and Alexandra. Um, perhaps I could kick off with a question. Um, Cyclists and pedestrians get talked about in the same breath. We have pedestrian cyclists. Uh, obviously, their needs are different, uh, and sometimes they can be a bit contradictory or in conflict. How, how can uh, how can the two uh, groups of road users recognise and they're often the same people but using a different mode? How can they actually live happily alongside? Mario, how would you answer that? Yes, uh, yes, it's it's a very um, complex problem, uh, and the irritating answer is it depends. I think in what uh, <laughs> basically depends on is the space, the quantity of space, the, the, the width of the canal available, and the, the, the balance between the two, the two modes. Uh, I think it's not comfortable for, for cyclists when they are uh, in very narrow um, um, canals with uh, a lot of um, channels, with a lot of um, sorry, um, corridors with a lot of um, pedestrians, for example. I think this is a struggle for pedestrian areas all over Europe uh, that sometimes they are forbidden uh, for the chagrin of the cyclists. Um, but, uh, and for example, along um, uh, rivers or along um, waterfronts, it's a very, very common problem. Uh, so what I think I usually say is that what we have to fight is fight together to conquer the space of the car. And I think that's probably what we have to do, uh, to speak more to each other and to understand that is the problem that we are being put aside as the same kind of uh, mode is actually just the companions of misfortune. And I think that's not something we should, uh, we should uh, um, feed on. Uh, Alexander, what do you have to say about that? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I very much like your answer, which also shows, I think, shows that there is not that much difference in opinion uh, between pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, there have been a few projects uh, in the past that uh, tried to look 
into how to best uh, uh, squeeze pedestrians and cyclists in limited uh, space, what kind of separation to use. But the, the basic thing is uh, the space available for those two groups uh, uh, together. But maybe, maybe one thing that uh, should be taken into account that uh, there is a very strong pressure to make this, uh, to turn streets into places, but it also requires more space than uh, you need to provide enough space to displace function. So it's, it cannot be, uh, it cannot be just uh, done by on the same side, uh, size of sidewalk and then expect uh, pedestrians to, to, to stay in the same, the same space. And, and please don't put cyclists on the sidewalk. I think that's a, that's a common that's a common thing in the south of Europe to put uh, bike lanes on sidewalks, and I think that's a well, very very bad practice. Well, uh, actually, I can argue with that. I think it also depends on the on the situation. Uh, we it's a bit different in the city center, and it's yes, different yeah. on a Think on about a route. Uh, urban areas. Yes. Yes, from the that connects the suburbs to the to the center it depends on the amount of pedestrians and cyclists. Yes, I was struck by your phrase, Mario, companions of misfortune. I think that's a, a sad way of describing it, but it's probably very realistic. Francesco. Yes, Peter, we have a question in the chat, in the, in the Q&A box uh, by Dieter Schwab at Workspace in Austria, who asks, what is the best tool to measure walkability? Hi, Dieter. Um, um, there is many, many tools about walkability and uh, I've been uh, working with them in the past years and uh, one thing I noticed that there is very, very degrees because you can use them, for example, with children. I've done one for children to be used with children like six, seven, eight years old with little faces, happy, sad and all that. And there is um, tools for activists or politicians. I've done with politicians on the street, which is an exercise of observation. Um, but of course, there is very, very complex uh, technical uh, walkability uh, indexes or surveys that uh, uh, required very, very um, um, a lot of time and uh, quite a bit of extensive knowledge, technical knowledge to use. So there is not like a, a, an answer for that. I think it depends on what kind of tool and which people you want to, uh, to use with. I think what is very, very important is that, um, that you use these tools, very simple tools to make people aware. Another thing that exists also, but is not very much used, it's apps on the mobile phones that you can actually um, uh, measure the walkability of a street and then up Upload. So um, you can actually, you know, start uploading the walkability of the street of each uh, of cities around the world. Okay, thank you. Perhaps I just make one comment. I, I, unfortunately, academics make these things very complicated, and and within the academic literature, the walkability is used to mean two different things. Yes. Um, one is to mean what's the propensity to walk. So in, in a sense, in a high density area, there's more likelihood of people being there to walk. And the other one is how fit is the infrastructure for walking? And they're measuring rather different things. So one needs to be careful exactly which you're referring to, I think. Um, Alexandra, I was just thinking, um, just observing in London uh, where cycling has grown, and we had the cycle superhighways and very much focused really on, on middle-aged men traveling very quickly by bicycle to work. Now with all the recent encouragement, there are more and more people cycling. And I can see there's some tension arising between the light crew men who want to get there very quickly and the families who are out cycling with their children. Um, how, 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 what, what's the view in the cycling world about how to sort of deal with these different views and whether they are compatible or, or how to deal with them? I think the cycling world was, uh, has always been trying to explain that there is no one standard cyclist that uh, can be considered always with the same speed, with the same size of bicycle and uh, uh, behaving always the same. So what is uh, now proposed in the most advanced uh, cycling countries is to have a distinct, uh, distinct uh, networks or at least at some sections, this the distinct routes for uh, fast cyclists and for uh, different types of user, for uh, recreational cyclists, for cyclists that uh, are only beginning to, to learn to cycle. And I think London is in the situation where the pure, the number of people living in London might actually justify this, this kind of approach. And 
well, I haven't been to London really recently, but uh, two or three years ago, I, I, I saw that they are start already developing the, uh, apart from the cycle superhighway network, uh, the, the fast, uh, the big routes, there's also a quiet way network to connect local streets and to allow the travel on more through more uh, quiet neighborhoods. This is different of what they developed on, uh, in, for example, in the Netherlands, because in the Netherlands, they would also put uh, uh, cycle highways uh, through local streets, but it's also an approach that it's uh, worth considering. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. I was just thinking of a pedestrian equivalent, Marion, and there was a suggestion on Oxford Street in London that there ought to be a lane for people that want to walk straight through to separate them from people who are stopping to look in shop windows and so on. I guess it's a it's a sort of equivalent problem in a rough way. Yes, um, yes, there, you know, I, sometimes I say there is an equivalent of the um, Athens Charter from the modernist movement of architects that wanted to split the city in very functions and actually was worse than, than before. So uh, I think this idea of, um, you know, separating public space in different channels, uh, they have a lot of um, problems afterwards that we didn't think of. So um, in general, the flexibility of pedestrian is actually something strong that we should be able to use. If you start channeling too much uh, pedestrians, I think we will have a lot of problems. Uh, but I think that has been tried to be used like at Christmas time in Madrid and was really a joke. And I think politicians uh, gave up after a while. Um, but you have this already for pedestrians. You have, you have this, uh, for example, on the escalators Escalate. in metro. Yes, yes. So escalators. You... Yes, yes, yes. yes. And also, and then, yes, uh, London. The London metro actually uh, realized that uh, if you actually uh, stop, uh, you uh, pack more pedestrians on the escalator instead of uh, make them walk, which is counterintuitive. But uh, you know, and you, may, you make fat, fat pedestrians afterwards. So uh, there is always a... <laughs> and also what we have seen in the COVID times in many shopping streets, it's you separate the direction of movement for pedestrians. So you make yes. it, make them behave more like cars. Exactly. Uh, I don't know if you have any observations from this. Uh... That's, that was the Madrid um, um, roles and I think it was not used for much longer than a few a week or so because people really didn't like that and I think what what that shows usually is that there is a lack of space uh, and uh, there is too much space uh, dedicated to cars so I think what we should start thinking is the space facade to facade and mm -hmm. to see the street as a whole as Peter said in the beginning so mm -hmm. um, and not just uh, manage sidewalks as they are. But this comes back to the discussion that we had in earlier workshop about uh, shared space. Shared space is an interesting solution, but it's not the best solution everywhere. Yeah. So it's uh, it's uh, it might work for cyclists and pedestrians to have shared space for larger range of instances than for uh, cars and pedestrians, but it's not always the, the best solution. And sometimes you have to separate these different speeds, different types of users. One thing we find out about shared space is that shared space needs a lot of preparation to reduce the number of cars so that the, 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 the critical mass of cyclists and pedestrians really take over. And sometimes projects for project uh, for shared spaces are, don't have this kind of uh, um, holistic approach towards the area wide and uh, and you should reduce speeds and I think that's uh, very crucial for shared space and and I think there was a, one or two failures London exhibition road I think is going to be re re redone uh, because there was too many cars and um, and the, the space was not perceived as safe and I think that's uh, unfortunate because uh, a lot of okay. projects for shared space are quite good. Yes. Um, Francesca, is, are there any other questions in the question and answer? If not, I'll go on to the next session. I don't see questions. I just see some okay. uh, comments and reactions in the chat. So for everyone, uh, you're welcome to, to add your comments. But if you have specific questions to speakers, just add them to the Q&A box. But yeah, Peter, for good. the moment, we don't have any. OK, well, in that case, I'd just like to thank uh, Mario and Alexandra very much um, for the presentations and the discussion. And I'll just move on to the last section. So thank you. So in the first session, uh, we had uh, two presentations from academics. In the session you've just heard, 
uh, we had a uh, consultant uh, and we had two uh, NGOs representing different user groups. In the last session, we're going to turn to the cities themselves where it all comes together and really uh, are in the most important situation. And first of all, I'm going to invite uh, Wiesenboom from the city of Malmo to talk about work they've been doing within more. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. I don't know if you can see that I, I've been hijacked. I have uh, three logins with um, my beloved colleagues are hijacking me. I hope it's going to work anyway. Yeah, we can see your screen. Good. So, uh, thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me at this uh, session. Um, I hope I can give some kind of contribution from a city. And it's really a pleasure to be involved in this project. It's such high standards and uh, hugely inspiring to meet and interact with everyone involved. So, thank you. Um, yeah, we see in Malmö a great chance to extend and expand our way of doing things, uh, spe specifically, of course, how we plan our streets, uh, taking a holistic view on planning and uh, putting humans in focus and not the vehicles. Of course, Malmö is not the largest city in the scope. Um, we're uh, we're, we're not a dense city in many aspects. We're striving for density, uh, but only a city of 330,000 people now. Uh, still, we have our challenges. And of course, yeah, we, we're doing fine environmental wise, but when it comes to quality of life, street space, we probably have a lot left to do. Uh, the study area on the Moore project is, is a redevelopment area, which is uh, uh, very industrial like today and will be uh, very much more of a mixed use in the coming couple of decades. And when we're planning, we usually, traffic wise, we, we um, we're always leaning on our sustainable urban mobility plan, the SUMP. And um, uh, we're also in the progress of implementing a large program for improvements for public transport and cycling called the Big City Package, investing about 400 million euros into arterial streets. So that's a, a big chance for us to make some kind of change here. And uh, as many cities, the main goal of urban development is to make the city more dense and not have an urban sprawl. Um, we know how to design a functional street in general, we think at least. Um, but it's very much focused on improving for public transport and cycling and making streets safe. Um, and as, as we stand now, the SUMP is showing the way towards sustainability. And of course, that's good, that's a big step, but there is more to do. And um, you've seen this before. And uh, we've chosen to use this also as a basis for our work. And um, we've defined them in, in these uh, words below here, where mobility is the car favoring uh, strategy in its, in its essence. Sustainability is, as I said, favoring public transport and cycling mostly, and this is where we stand now probably in our planning paradigm. And then livability, uh, to create an environment promoting street life, using more aggressive maybe measures to redirect or minimize the amount of motor vehicles. When we go about um, uh, implementing and, and uh, working in the more projects, we're trying really to focus on involvement and a broad approach on planning for traffic and street design. And to do this, 
we, for Manuel's part, need to use reference sites and uh, get a really good basis for generating ideas and designs. Um, the study area that we're using is, is, uh, is as I said, a redevelopment area. So, so we want to represent these three uh, sus mo mobility, sustainability, and livability areas in, in these reference sites to use. And the tools and improvements to software provided in the project are a really important part of making this a really live experience to help us do things really well in detail. The reference areas themselves um, are chosen, as I said, to represent the three planning strategies or paradigms. Uh, so we can get a useful current situation for the study area uh, of our project. So uh, I'll take you through some, some of the results we have and uh, some of our key findings so far. And I'd say, uh, the work with public involvement and stakeholder engagement has really given us extremely valuable in inputs. And um, we did approximately 1,300 interviews that gave us some results of how people see their streets. And this is where this was done also in the reference areas then. So, uh, if you uh, remember the mobility, sustainability, and livability parts of the breakdown in paradigms. This is what people using this, these three different types of reference areas think of these places and the street environments they're moving in today. So the places with a car dominated design are seen as disordered, dangerous, high speed, and to some extent, street life space. The places with an orientation towards a favoring of public transportation and cycling, the sustainability one in the middle. They're also seen as disordered, high speed street life also, but also dangerous and to some extent pleasant. The places with a design attempting to promote urban street life are seen as pleasant street life and inviting and accessible to some extent. And then we, ask, we asked people, how do you see the streets if you could decide how it could change for the future? Uh, on this part, we see the results are more consistent over the scope of paradigms. There's a clear favoring of pleasant, inviting, climate smart, street life, and convenience. Another very important part of the project is to have useful and as much as possible observations that cover all modes of movement and activities. The observations were done at the reference sites and included motor vehicles, cyclists, and pedestrians. So that's an, a, an attempt of getting a larger scope of the movements. Uh, coming and ongoing work, uh, there's a lot still remaining with the MORE project and we have a lot of results yet to be presented. Um, one, one key element I'd say is is how we're going to uh, create future situations for our study area, where we involve the planners uh, in the study area and their current projects. And here we're going to do all, all of the, these uh, different tasks. As we see it, um, we often have these um, great visionary sketches of things of how the city can be, can be changed. So um, we'd like to give an attempt at trying to reach those visionary sketches also. 
Uh, at first, we're, with the project, we're really learning new methods of doing our work as planners and how to develop our streets in a very pragmatic way, I think. We're getting, we're getting the new knowledge on, in ink documented and uh, regarding above all individual needs and desires from the people who use the streets. And it gives us some kind of conclusion. We do need a broad implementation of stakeholder and public engagement in the process of urban development. It's really not new, but it, it's, it's really important to keep on pushing for it. The more project has emphasized that our next step can be, can be to take in people's desire of what kind of city they want to live in. So by working with this project, we've discovered how we more in detail can come around to doing this. And we really have the chance of making a mark in the already ongoing redevelopment of a big chunk of the city. There's a need to get into the next level of planning, creating a city of places and not only movement. Question is, can we shift our focus in traffic planning from movement of, of and space for vehicles to movement of and space for people? We think we also need a clearer view of the totals and the preconditions. In Malmö, we need to broaden the scope of preconditions because today, the normal case is that we know very much about motorized traffic by historic data and forecasts and all this. We've spoken about that earlier. Uh, in the best case, we do have uh, uh, information about cyclists, but we know very little about pedestrian traffic or the preconditions and needs for the city as a place and in itself. Uh, place in itself and the use of public spaces and the use of public spaces as an extended living room. Uh, for us, uh, the more project opens this door. And that was actually my last slide. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think uh, what I found most fascinating about, about the survey results you presented was that regardless of the type of streets on which you interview people, so regardless of their current situation, their, their vision for the, the ideal street for the future is very, very similar. That yeah. People share a similar view of the sort of streets they like. And I think the other thing that's very surprising was that um, whether the street was dominated by general motor traffic or was a major conduit for buses and cyclists and things, people reacted very similarly to both of those, just the sheer volume and speed of movement, whatever type it was. And I think as planners, we tend to make the distinction between sustainable mobility is good and car traffic is bad, but from the perception of somebody actually in that street, they don't really see such a difference. And I think maybe that's something we need to, to reflect on. So thank you very much for that. And you stressed also that, um, you know, you're moving towards the idea of a city of livability and city of places. Uh, and then our last speaker from Lisbon, uh, Francisco Costa, is going to talk to us uh, about an example of how Lisbon has moved forward uh, in the work it's done. Um, those of you you know who, tra who perhaps travel there on holiday will remember 10 or 20 years ago, Lisbon was very much car dominated. But now in the centre of Lisbon, they've got some of the most amazing public spaces that I've seen anywhere. So very interested to hear an example of what's going on over the bottom there. So please, over to you. Thank you. Uh you see my screen, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone from Sunny Lisbon. Uh, thank you for the previous presentations and for the opportunity to share with you our tactical urbanism intervention at Arruessua. Um, Arruessua literally means the street is yours. And you had a first edition that I'll explain briefly uh, in 2019. And then it morphed to respond to the pandemic challenges. I'll explain how and show you a teaser of some of the results. And then finally, finally I'll show you in detail a project that we are currently implementing on site. So in 2019, the city of Lisbon decided to address the problem with traffic congestion and pollution levels by closing one of the main and more polluted avenues of Lisbon 
during a Sunday and evaluate the results. On the last Sunday of each month since May 2019 and 19, and until the last Sunday of the year, the central lanes of Avenida da Liberdade has been closed to traffic. People could experience the city without cars one day per month to events such as Cargo, uh, Cargo Bike Fest and other uh, to promote active mobility. There was a significant re reduction in uh, both uh, pollution levels uh, and noise levels. And then again, COVID, um, our first emergency state was declared in March with a total lockdown that lasted until May. In May, the municipality decided to change the initial co concept of this program to respond to the pand pandemic challenges in terms of public space. Uh, these changes were unanimously approved by the Lisbon Assembly and the, go the goals uh, are stated here. They were basically um, to create or increase the, uh, in area spaces for safe walking, eliminating car parking, to prevent and mitigate the public health risks still arising from the pandemic, to support local businesses by increasing the number of parklet terrace areas, promoting temporary or permanent uh, urban art interventions in public spaces so that can people uh, uh, can experience uh, uh, streets without cars and create uh, coexistence or pedestrian areas shaded and comfortable. Um, uh, the parklet terraces or esplanadas, as we call it, uh, have the goal to support the local economy. Basically, local businesses are entitled to request uh, the parking spot at their shop front uh, and develop their uh, activities outside where it's safer and it's free of charge until the end of the year. Currently, we have 273 applications uh, received, 222 approved, and currently, unfortunately, all outdoor and indoor dining is closed, but outdoor dining will be set to reopen on the 5th of April, so we, we expect an increase in applications in the coming weeks. Um, for the public space interventions, the selection criteria derived from the works already done in another program called Uma uh, Praça Cada Bairro, which crossed the population density map to the existing uh, public space available, and also uh, the, the map uh, of the highly exposed heat island, islands. Um, it also identified areas uh, with high pedestrian affluence, such as those surrounding, uh, surrounding social, uh, educational, or health equipment, commercial areas, transport interfaces whose sidewalks are too small for um, the load of services they have. In terms of tactical urbanism materials, I'll pass that. We basically were allowed to use paint, signage, and urban furniture uh, and planters. Um, this is the current status. We have 15 in, uh, interventions implemented and um, a thousand square meters already uh, uh, given back to pedestrians, and we plan to double that in the near future. Here you can see uh, the before and after images of uh, the interventions in uh, Center Maria Mayor, one of the local councils. Basically, these roads were closed to traffic permanently and uh, had an increase in pedestrian area that allowed for outdoor dining. Uh, such a fresh, uh, Satisfaction survey was conducted in this council with the restaurants and shop owners. I don't have uh, time to go in, in detail uh, in this presentation, but I would like highlight that 94% of uh, people responding to this survey wanted the program to continue and 78% uh, would be dissatisfied and uh, more than half of that of those uh, very dissatisfied if uh, things went back to what they were before these interventions. Another type of interventions uh, was uh, weekend events. Uh, basically, uh, here in Rua de Postos Negros, uh, this uh, street was closed from uh, Friday to, um, to Sunday, uh, from July to December. And it was so, so successful that it's uh, scheduled to restart with the reopening of the economy in April. Uh, Rua da Silva, which was also uh, nearby, was also su successful that uh, there is a proposal to permanently uh, pedestrianize this, this street. Uh, this is another interesting intervention because they closed one of the blocks of the street and they used the carpentries and metal workshops of the actual street to repurpose materials to build the urban furniture you see here 
uh, to uh, install in the intervention. Another type of uh, uh, interventions were school uh, areas where we pedestrianized the entrance of the school and uh, had some traffic calming uh, measures. And on this specific uh, weekend event, a uh, community garden wall was, uh, was installed and is still in place. And there's a proposal that derived from this week, uh, uh, weekends in September um, uh, for a, an increase in pedestrian area around this, uh, this place. Um, going into the, the, the project, I, will, I want to show you in detail. Basically, um, the, the map you see uh, is the densest square kilometer in L Lisbon and Portugal, and one, one of the densest uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, actually, the location of the, the Moore project is uh, at the right, uh, at, at the center of this square, and Mercado de Ruiz, which is the intervention I'll talk about, is this one in the border. Uh, this is a very dense area. It has a great lack of qualified space and is also highly affected. You can see here on this small map, it's highly affected by heat waves. So uh, zoom at the market uh, surroundings to show you the problems we identify. We have really long crossings, pedestrian crossings around the market. So the, the access to the market is not fairly easy and we have a huge decades long pro problem of illegal parking, sidewalk parking, parking on the crosswalks, double parking, all kinds of illegal parking that by obstructing the visibility uh, uh, puts in danger both pedestrians and cars and leads to uh, uh, pedestrian heats and, and car crashes. Um, this is the situation on, on the ground so you can see basically cars everywhere and this is sort of the concept uh, for this intervention. We wanted to dedicate the, uh, the inner uh, parking ring of the market to functions directly linked to the market. So wider pedestrian area to improve the pedestrian access to the market, great loading base, disabled parking, passenger drop off and parklet terraces. Uh, this is the long street, long crosswalk slides again to show you that uh, the street corners were extended uh, to reduce the longest pedestrian crossings just to three and a half meters from 26. Uh, with this extension, we increased the pedestrian area of the market surroundings by more than 1,000 square meters and gain, uh, gained mostly to road space uh, used for illegal parking, allowing for a safe access to the market. The pavement will include an urban art intervention to give a new identity to the space, making it a pleasant pedestrian area and minim minimizing the road character it had until now. This is just brief photos of the installation. We had to use the, because of the COVID constraints, to use the teams from the municipal, the municipality and borough. And even with the space unfinished, people immediately took over. So you can see that there was this necessity of more public space. Finally, um, there was a competition for st the street art intervention. Um, the the uh, urban art gallery of the municipality together with the council of Roy selected one of the proposals and this intervention has like a strong visual impact that helps to change the identity of the space immediately losing its road character to become a space of enjoyment and uh, that promotes safer and active mobility the theme of the competition was the functional aspect of the market and its products mixed with the multiculturalism of this neighborhood uh, there's a claim by the council that they have uh, 92 different nationalities among its residents. Some images first of the existing car chaos, uh, a rendered image of what we expected it to be, and an image from yesterday of the ongoing works. These are uh, the artists on the ground, literally. And finally, what is already completely completed of the intervention, I think, uh, I've run out of time, Peter. No, perfect timing. Thank you very much indeed for Jessica. I'm very impressed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and I think I think what you've demonstrated is again in, in the first part of your presentation that Lisbon has been very ambitious in looking across the city and how it can respond to COVID. I think probably in a more comprehensive way than than many cities. Um, and then this actual example here, I think, is fascinating. Completely changing the space allocation. And I think the point that you made that. Having done that, people naturally started coming there. 
just shows what suppressed demand there is and what difference, not only for movement, but also in placemaking, how much suppressed demand there is for people to want to live in their environment uh, and, and the traffic and the allocation of space prevents that. And I think that's one of the challenges we face, actually, that, that we know from your experience and elsewhere, that if you create attractive spaces, it draws people. But in terms of making the case beforehand, we have very little evidence to actually say, to show, you know, if you do this, it will actually attract people uh, and it will increase uh, community life. It, it will potentially increase economic uh, spending as well. We just need more evidence of that, I think, to give politicians the confidence to do what you've demonstrated here on a wider scale. So thank you very much indeed. That was really great. Uh, on that, um, Peter, just let me just say uh, something. We had uh, the first the first uh, intervention we we showed basically the the these business, businesses were closed until May, so they didn't have basically any any uh, revenue, and they said that on the first day, the first lunch that they served outside, they made more because this, this took a little bit to implement. So they they were open, but actually no one uh, was going inside. And on the first day that they they opened, they made more revenue than the previous uh, days until Jan uh, or March, where where the first lockdown started. Just to complement your great. Program. I really think this needs pushing. Thank you very much indeed, Francisco. That's great. So if I can enjoy, uh, invite Per to join us, switch on his camera as well. Um, and then, um, Francisco, do we have any questions or comments? Yes, we do, Peter. We have a question in the Q&A uh, box about Malmo uh, and the experience in Malmo. And the question was, were only citizens interviewed or also people living in the region around? Uh, which need to go to town for services, shopping or work. So co commuters or only residents? Uh, the interviews were made with people moving in the specific sites. So they could be from any, from anywhere, but a uh, majority of them were residents, I'd say. But these were people in who were using the street. It, it, it didn't uh, interview people passing through the street without stopping, I guess. It was the people who were using the street as a place. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, is that, I, mean, I think this is one of the very difficult things about how you decide who to interview um, and what weight to give. I mean, looking much more generally, places like Amsterdam, where they, a number of years ago, they introduced restrictions in the inner city area. Or uh, if you take Stockholm, uh, when they introduced their congestion charging scheme, um, what you invariably find is that people living in the area support these restrictions, but people living outside don't. And then there's a very difficult question about you know how, how you balance up those different, different things. Is that also an issue in Lisbon about who you consult and what weight you give to different views when you're making these decisions? Uh, consultation in the pandemic con uh, uh, context is a challenge per se. Usually, I think for these uh, big projects, if, if they were going to be built, there, were, there would be uh, public meetings and public consultations, and that's sort of challenging with, with COVID that we can't do it basically. Uh, and we're starting, we, uh, the city did it for some uh, pop-up cycle lanes, uh, an online consultation where it's basically a gathering like this one uh, that people that want to participate either uh, for or against uh, have, have a say and they can try and improve the project. So we're starting on that, but if you have any apps or tools for that uh, we're open to suggestions i think to improve i think that's the part because uh, this specific intervention had some contestation uh, contestation uh, from the the market uh, shoppers uh, uh, and we did an, an online meeting just with a representative of, of those uh, uh, of, uh, of these people and i think it lacked to hear voices because the residents have a, a, a perspective and the, 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 the shop owners have another, the clients have another. So I think we need a forum where to uh, make aware that people have different needs and all of them have to come together because the space in the end is very limited. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's very important. Um, and, and, and I guess in a way, uh, I think partly stimulated by COVID, then we can drop to twin track approach where people actually living or or coming to the area um, there's some scope for, for at least um, intercepting them and, and sampling them directly um, but uh, if you want to get wider people you can do web-based consultation for that right? because um, people don't have to be in that local area to be to be able to contribute on the web I guess. Sure. Um, but one, one thing I was thinking that the work you described you're doing more that that was sort of designed before 
uh, COVID came along and obviously Sweden's had some less restrictions than other places, but I think nevertheless you've had some restrictions. Do you think that's influenced attitude and maybe the same in Lisbon? Do you think the, the, the restrictions has changed attitudes towards people actually wanting, and where there has been, for example, as you showed in Lisbon, streets temporarily closed, closed to traffic. Do you think um, this is actually will lead to a permanent change about people wanting to get a higher priority to livability in street activities and so on? Pearl, what do you think? Uh, I think so. Yeah, there, there's a lot of focus on um, on uh, cycling as well in, in Sweden now. And, and I, I hope it gets to the national level because that's, I, in my opinion, our uh, weak spot on uh, intercity um, mm -hmm. questions. But but I, I, on, on city level, yes, there is, a, I think, more focus on using the space as a vulnerable road user. Mm -hmm. Just uh, in Lisbon, I think people are more aware, uh, both they are uh, increasingly more aware because of climate change and all that, but with the lockdown, people were locked in their towns uh, most of the time, so they were more, even more aware of their needs. The conflict then is because they want more public space and more cycling, but not in their parking spot in front of their building. So this, and, and we are still uh, very dependent on car uh, to move around, so it's a uh, difficult conflict to, to solve. And also like all the shops think all of their, their clients come uh, by car, which is not true at all, but still we have to prove that to them. So it's it's a conflict and we need to manage the best we can these kind of conflicts that the city yeah. brings. Just to comment on your last point, I mean, there have been several surveys in England. Um, what you tend to find is shopkeepers think that the, the car drivers are the ones that actually bring most income and so on. And what we find is that they're right and they're wrong in that on a per trip basis, car drivers spend more than pedestrians, but they come much less often. So if you look on a weekly or monthly basis, they get much more from pedestrians and cyclists and bus users. But on a per trip basis, so you can sort of understand why the shopkeeper remembers the person that always spends 50 or 100 euros, but yeah. they don't actually understand that over a period of time, actually that's not where they get most of their income from. So maybe there's some education there that would help. Possibly. Please send me a link to the study. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll send you some details. Charlotte, uh, just going back to that previous point about, in a sense, in, in public engagement, who, who do you try and involve, you know, who has a legitimate voice and how do you balance these off? Any thoughts from your work? I think there are two, two aspects of things. I mean, when, when we look at public participation, the way it's being done, of course, you can either consult the public um, in order to discuss a very specific design, and this is what a number of cities are saying. So they want to introduce a specific measure and they go into public participation, consult the public to get feedback and engage. Um, it's really then more about consultation and actually uh, uh, attempt to question the policy in question and to take in uh, some of uh, some more core uh, concerns and fundamental concerns about how mobility more generally is organized at city level. So it's really about you know, mitigating the impact of that proposed measure. But then you have uh, other strategies which have been developed as part of climate plans. Uh, for example, uh, some of the work being done in cities such as Antwerp, for example, or Paris, uh, but there are other cities in Europe currently engaged in this process. We're trying to consult uh, citizens um, uh, before uh, actual measures are being designed. And this is used for two different reasons. First, to maybe think about new needs and think differently about needs related to mobility. And second, it is also a very good way to challenge politicians and technicians in the city administration about how to actually plan mobility and future needs. And this links also to the discussion this afternoon, I think, um, to uh, not just focus on a measure, but really to think in terms of how do they want to live in the city in the next 10 to 20 years? Um, what uh, do citizens think in terms of um, what would make a livable city? So a little bit what Pierre was uh, showing and to then use the results of this public um, consultation as leverage also to change and challenge both politicians and the administration. I think there is a lot of work to be done and to consult also within politics and within uh, city administrations. And this is also where some veto points are being uh, found, uh, maybe less visible than people demonstrating on the streets, uh, but still uh, quite uh, useful and, and to, to understand if you want to overcome some of those vetoes. Okay, thank you very much. We're almost out of time, but one of the questions in the uh, chat was, do we need to generalize speed 30? I presume that means 30 kilometers per hour, not 30 miles an hour. Um, so uh, 20 seconds uh, from uh, four people, I'm gonna ask uh, Alexander first. 
put the view about uh, uh, 30 kilometer hour speed limit standard in cities. That timely helps to ensure road safety. There always be some exceptions. So if you if you put the same speed limit on all the streets or the same kind of restrictions on all the streets, then you don't get really this network level separation. So this kind of uh, hmm. you want the there will always be well, for any foreseeable future there will be car traffic in the city, and you want to direct it to certain routes and keep it from other routes. So there yeah. there needs to be some. Uh, balance between 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 this and the even the cities that have this 30 kilometer speed limit as a general rule, Brussels, for example, introduced on 1st January this year, they still leave some exceptions for major routes where they want to uh, channel the car traffic to keep it from the local neighborhoods. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Mario, very quickly, quick response. Yes, um, yeah, there is a, a little bit of um, a controversy here. Some people say that if we put the 30 kilometers per hour uh, well, um, citywide, um, actually, um, you, it might work that people reduce the speeds not to 30, but to 40, and that actually gives a certain um, advantage and benefit. Other people say, no, 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 we should start um, uh, changing the streets first. The problem with changing the streets first is that we need money and time. So there is this conflict that is quite interesting and people are discussing it right now. But obviously there are cities that have been doing uh, 30 kilometers per hour after a lot of work beforehand with 30 kilometers zone first, yeah. uh, like uh, grass or billboard for example, started uh, three years ago, then okay. uh, now, uh, now is 100% of the streets. Okay, thank you. I, I knew I couldn't get you both to do it in 20 seconds. I'm sorry. We've run out of time, actually, and we're a minute over, so I apologise for that. I think it's very important to keep these things for time. So I'd just like to, to thank all our speakers this morning, Charlotte Rubino, uh, Simon, who's left us, Mario, Alexander, uh, Perla, and Francisco. Thank you all very much for a really interesting morning session. There'll be another session this afternoon starting at two o'clock uh, Central European time, where we'll be here, we've been looking at the current conditions that people are facing in that session this afternoon, we're looking more to the future. So please join us if you can. Thank you very much, speakers, and also thank you very much for the attendees. See you a bit later on. Goodbye.